Just a sec, sorry, I gotta get this. Uh, we'll get to that in a, in a moment. All right, so this is a uh, story about how an idea that probably sounds ridiculous on paper might just save you from a global catastrophe that you probably didn't know you needed to worry about. And uh, I'm an engineer, so for me, this is a story about how sometimes the best solutions and the most simple solutions aren't always the most obvious solutions. And uh, that's what I'm here to talk about, and, and we'll, we'll open that up in a bit. So first, imagine you're, uh, you're sitting on an airplane, you're about three quarters of the way through your flight, you open that little pack of peanuts that they gave you, and you're eating a few of them, and the ding comes on. It's like, hey, we're getting ready to land. Stewardess is coming down, and maybe you're watching TV. You know, they got satellite TV on these airplanes, a little seat back screen now. And it uh, starts to flicker a little bit. Not sure what's up with that, but you don't really think take another handful of peanuts, and pretty soon the lights start to flicker. And if you're up in the cockpit, the instruments go dark, airplane starts to do this thing, you know. It's bad news, right? It's a bad situation. All right, so so what happened? What do you think went wrong in this situation? Pro probably not, probably not going where you expect with this. So what what about this? Uh, coronal mass ejection is what this is called. You probably know that solar flare is another term. This is a, a pretty big one uh, from about 2012. It's a NASA footage. It's pretty cool that they can take these kind of pictures, right? So this thing blasts out of the sun and it's racing toward the earth. And along with that, that matter from the sun, here, here it comes, isn't that great? And uh, along with that matter from the sun is radiation, right? There's, uh, there's electromagnetic radiation coming at you. And what, what does this do? So if you guys have seen Ocean's Eleven, uh, that, there's that part where they set off the EMP, right? All the lights in Vegas go out. I'm not sure that thing really exists, but that's the idea, right? That's, that's what happens. And at, at a high level, th this is a real phenomenon, right? This happens every day. I think most of you probably know that this is a thing, but you don't really worry about it because it hasn't really affected your life, right? But it can. And, and I'm not just talking about maybe and what could happen. Um, in 1859, there was something called the Carrington event. It was a very large solar flare that came racing across towards Earth. And, and when it got here, it wreaked havoc with some things. It made some pretty lights in the sky, but also people who were sitting at telegraph keys got blown out of their chairs by the radiation that got picked up. I'm, I mean, it's a real thing. And that was a time where electronics and electricity at all really were not exactly used quite as much as they are today. I, I bet most of you have some pretty complicated electronic devices in your pocket right now, right? So if this were to happen again, and it could, this is just statistics, it, it can happen, we could have a lot of serious problems. Um, the airplane falling out of the sky is probably an extreme example, but what's a lot more likely is, is impact on satellites, right? They're out in space. They don't have the protection of the Earth's atmosphere to keep that radiation away. So satellites, maybe doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but probably stop and think about how often you interact with the satellite every day. You don't probably think about it, but you punch up an address on your phone and it tells you where to go. That's using GPS satellites. You turn your radio on in a newer car, it's probably coming through from satellite. Um, if you live in a more remote area, you might get internet or, you know, phone. The way you, you stay in touch with your family is used through satellites. So this is something that would have a pretty big impact on society as a whole if it happened. And it's something that's probably worth preparing for, right? So what are we going to do about it? So I'm here to tell you about one solution, not the only solution, but this is one I work on and so I'm excited about it, right? So this, this solution, I'm going to try to walk you through this, and it, hopefully it won't get too techy for you, but there's four key technologies that make this up. Um, so we'll talk through them real quick. The first one is called uh, sailing. So you've probably heard of this one. It's been around for a while. You <laughs> put something up in the air like a sheet or something like that, right? And it carries you somewhere. Um, a lot of things can move in the air with wind blowing on them. So I think I probably don't have to explain this one very much. Um, the next one is, is uh, weather forecasting. Now, this has also been around for a while. I mean, I think there was a, a time where you put the rock outside the cave, right? And if the rock is wet, you know it's raining. But uh, we've come a long ways from that time, right? And so the kind of stuff we've been doing really only in the last 100 years is numerical weather prediction, where we, we take measurements all around the Earth, we put all that together, we do some math, we try to predict where air is moving through the sky, and we use that to tell... You know, is it going to rain tomorrow and things like that? And, and that can be pretty serious, right? If, if, if it's going to rain tomorrow, it may not matter that much. But if you need to prepare because of hurricanes racing across the ocean, right? That's probably a big deal. You're glad you have that. 
Um, and then the last one here that I'm going to talk about uh, is machine learning. So if you work in a technology field and you give some kind of a technology talk and you don't use machine learning, you're doing something wrong in this day and age and people will look down upon you. But there is actually an application for machine learning here. There's data coming together and we're, we're using that technology. So we'll talk about how in a little bit. So those are the first three. So now the, uh, the fourth thing I've got for a technology is inside this box here. And uh, you never know if you should do an actual technical demo live. There's always things that can go wrong, but I'm going to give it a shot, so bear with me. So I just got to you know, keep these things protected, you know. Uh, yeah, so there we go. <laughs> this, uh, this is a talk about balloons. I don't know if you were expecting that. If you read the brochure, I might have given it away, but uh, that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this section. Maybe not what you would have expected. I brought a visual. I think most of you probably would have known what a balloon was already, but um, <laughs> wanted to be a helper. So uh, this, is, this is a great thing to laugh about, and, and I, I still think it's crazy that this is something I get to work on, but there's serious business to be done here. This is something uh, that serious companies are putting money into and a real solution to this problem. So uh, people like NASA... Uh, Loon, if you follow, that's a spin out of Google Project, uh, Google's Incubator Lab, um, the Department of Defense, and uh, Raven Industries, which is where I work here in town. There's me and about 35 engineers that uh, eat, sleep, and breathe balloon technology every day. Sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? Everyone loves the balloon guy. So, uh, what do we do with the balloon to? stop you from falling out of the sky on the airplane. It might sound like a stretch, but there really is a story here, and, it, and it's legitimate. So I'm going to talk you through it, and maybe with a little less humor and a little more tech now, so hopefully your eyes don't roll back in your head. So these are, these are balloons, but they're serious balloons. They're not like this balloon, obviously. Um, these are large, complicated balloons that can carry hundreds of pounds. Um, they fly for, you know, two, three hundred days at a time up, up in the sky in the stratosphere. So these balloons go up to, say, 70 to 90,000 feet. So if you're on that jetliner, you're maybe at 30,000 feet. So we're talking two, three times the altitude a jetliner is. It's basically the edge of space. The atmosphere is about 2% up there of what it is here where we're sitting. Um, and they're, they're made of plastic film, you know, just like any other balloon. This is uh, polyethylene, like a, like a trash bag, but a pretty thin trash bag. These, these films are often like, 0.8 mils, which is a measure of, of thickness. Uh, trash bags are often two mils, maybe even four mils, if you buy the, you know, the hefty stretch kind that's not going to break when you're carrying it out. And uh, they weigh hundreds of pounds, the balloon itself. So we're talking about a lot of plastic film. These are large balloons. So I've got a, a video here of a balloon launch to kind of give you an idea. So that's probably a 50-foot tall balloon. That's one of the smaller ones uh, for doing this kind of thing. And uh, the basic principle here is, is fairly straightforward. It's similar to the one at play on stage here, helium likes to go up, so you put helium inside a plastic and the plastic goes up and then the stuff that it's carrying goes up too. Um, so that's, that's kind of an idea of what they look like at launch. Because they go up so high and into so low a pressure, when they get to altitude, they fill out. They're more shaped like a pumpkin. So if you haven't seen one from looking at uh, any of the scientific stuff or Google stuff, I've got a flattering picture of myself with the balloon here to give you a sense of scale. Uh, <laughs> That's actually uh, taken in a hangar, and that hangar is about 65, 70 feet tall. So just to give you an idea how big that is, uh, I could have gone and stood under it, but then you wouldn't get that great cameo effect. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's probably a 65, 70 foot balloon right there. This is technology that requires design. We wouldn't put 35 engineers on building one of those, obviously. Um, but it's, it's some serious work. Um, and, and then what do we do with the balloon? So it's all good and well that we, we saw the balloon go up and there's some electronics hanging down there and it's floating through the sky and that's all pretty nice and all that. And then what? Just flies away and ends up in the ocean somewhere? That, that probably wouldn't be very useful and it wouldn't solve the problem I was promising to solve, right? So the concept that we leverage at this point, going back to the weather prediction, is wind steering. So these balloons are like that sailboat. They don't have any propulsion. They float freely in the wind, but... We can move the balloon up and down by pumping ballast in and out of the balloon, and there are wind currents at different altitudes that take the balloons in different directions. So you see this nice, this is obviously an animation, but imagine at this lower altitude there's a wind layer that's generally going the path of the balloon, and then you want to turn the balloon to the right a little bit, 
If you know that that other altitude has got winds that are going in the direction you want, you can move the balloon up, catch that wind. It's like running a sailboat, but in three dimensions, right? So why is this complicated and, and, and what's hard about it? Well, it turns out that people who forecast what the weather is doing don't generally care what's happening at 80,000 feet. They care if it's going to rain tomorrow. That's what you care about. And that's where the machine learning and some of those things and, you know, the special sauce of the deal comes in is we have to be able to figure out what's happening up in layers of altitude where there's really no model for that. And so we're taking in the weather layers, we're taking in predictions and measurements and things from satellites, but we're also taking in, you know, radio sounds that are released around the country. And then we're taking measurements from the balloon itself and we use the machine learning, just fuse all that data together and try to paint a picture that says at these different altitudes, these are the directions the winds are going. And if you can do a good enough job of that, you can keep that balloon kind of where you want to keep it. So imagine that you're trying to replace a satellite that's gone and you need to park the balloon somewhere where you can receive the data from it. You got to be able to do that. You got to be able to steer it. So this is a uh, kind of an illustration of how that works from the top down. This is from a flight we did about a week ago. And you see the red and green arrows appear on the balloon. That's when it's going up and down in altitude. And you'll see we kind of just meander back and forth over, over the target there. That's the Raven Launch Facility north of Sioux Falls. And this whole time, we're within about 20 miles of, of that area. So if you're thinking about some of the things you can do with this, uh, GPS signal or like feeding data to your cell phone, 20 miles is not that far in terms of, of an RF signal, right? You're 20 miles from the radio tower most of the time you're receiving from it. And so you can do a lot with a platform that can be within 20 miles of the target and stay there. And the other thing to think about is that's a 24-hour clip. So there aren't very many aircraft, for example, that can park over an area for 24 hours. They run out of fuel, and you have that thing I was talking about at the start of the talk, right? Um, and same goes for satellites. Satellites are great, but we already talked about solar flares. But there's other things, right? Satellites are reasonably expensive. I think everyone has that sense. Getting something to space costs a lot of money. Um, they're complicated. It takes years to design one. Um, these balloons, we can be out of the box and in the air in about two hours for the first one, and maybe a half hour for each one after that. So... If you're trying to think about testing things in space environments, or if you're trying to think about cost effectiveness, or if you're trying to think about uh, re responding to an emergency, say that solar flare thing, I can get a lot of balloons in the air pretty quickly and try to recover from that situation. And it's not that we don't want to launch GPS satellites again, but it's what do you do until then? And, that, and that's a real application that they're being used for right now. With, with Project Loon that I talked about, that's the spin out of Google, they're doing communications where a hurricane will come and knock a place down. They don't have communication anymore, and people are trying to call their families, right? They're trying to say, I'm safe or I need help, and your cell phone doesn't work, right? That's a pretty bad feeling, and they're actually doing this right now. They're bringing balloons in, they're replacing those cell towers, and they're keeping them there until things are restored. So it's, it's not just an idea, it's, it's in practice. Now, one thing you might have noticed is that when I showed that clip of the balloon, it's kind of wandering back and forth, kind of looks like a drunk driver running around up there. And you can't really say, okay, I can park this right here and fly a racetrack like you could with an airplane. So if you expand that out to trying to cover a whole country, say, uh, or maybe the state of South Dakota, I need to be able to know that I'm going to have coverage across the state. And I can't necessarily predict exactly where those winds are going to be. So, so what do you do about that? Well, these are fairly inexpensive platforms, and that's where you move to a constellation of balloons. So you put multiple balloons up, and statistically, they're all kind of wandering around, but overall, you have the area covered. And this is also something that's happening today. So I took this screenshot off a public flight tracking website two days ago. So these are Google balloons, uh, Loon balloons. Loon has had 40 to 50 balloons in the air pretty much continuously for the last five or six years. Some projects we've been working with them on. And um, you can see that there's areas of Africa that they're signed up now to cover. They provide commercial service. It's relief for, for cell phones where there isn't that infrastructure um, so that people can communicate. And one thing you can notice is you kind of have a cluster of balloons over the middle that are, that are there covering that area, and then you have some balloons off to the side. So that's where the machine learning and the, the weather prediction comes in, and you say, hey, in a few days, I think there's a decent chance the winds are going to shift and everything's going to blow to the east. So then you go position some balloons over to the west to get ready for that. And if you can manage that intelligently, and that's where kind of the science comes in, you can provide continuous coverage and provide that kind of a service. Uh, this is something that isn't necessarily a strictly new idea. It might sound like it, but you know, like we already talked about, balloons have been around for a long time. People have been doing stratospheric high altitude balloons for over 100 years as well. And if you think back to like the 50s when the space program was getting started, they were using them for lots of things. 
Um, one really interesting one, I think, is they were trying to figure out with these high-flying uh, spy jets and stuff that were going up to the edge of space is, what do we do if the guy needs to eject, right? That's not a problem we've, we've necessarily solved before. And so they actually put a guy, a very brave test pilot, under a balloon. They lifted him up to 75,000 feet, and he was the first guy to jump with this new parachute that was supposed to work. Should go read about that if you want. It's pretty crazy. He, uh, he actually got caught on the parachute line. He was spinning 120 revolutions per second. He passed out, and then eventually the secondary chute auto-deployed, and he woke up and deployed the rest of the system and steered himself to safety. That's braver than I am, for sure. Um, but this is not a new idea. But why, so why are we talking about it? Why haven't we got balloons flying over the country right now? Is it that it doesn't work? Well, I think we just you know, showed you that it can work and it's working right now. But part of it is that whole data element, the machine learning, the control, even the electronics. You know, Being able to process that data on something that can go up on a balloon and figure out what it wants to do um, is a lot easier now than it used to be. Um, if there's any kind of hobbyists or tech people, you know, do you know what? People know what this is? This is, a, this is a Raspberry Pi, is what it's called. It's a $20 hobby computer that you can buy you know, off Amazon and start playing with if you're into electronics, uh, like I am. And the, the interesting thing about it is if you compare that back to the 50s when they started doing this stuff, that this little computer that I can get for 20 bucks has 500,000 times the amount of computational power that the Apollo 11 did. So there's a lot more stuff we can do now with a lot less weight and power and space than there used to be. In addition to that, if you look at solar panels, right? NASA started using solar panels on satellites in the 50s as it, has, as it goes, as well as there's a satellite called Vanguard 1, and those solar panels were about 10% efficient. We're in the range of 90-something percent efficient with solar technology now. So there's just a lot of enabling technologies that have come together. Um, the balloon part isn't uh, necessarily new or different, but a lot of other things that have come together to make this practical and make it work right now. So this is kind of how it works if you want to imagine back to our solar flare case. You've got your satellite up there and something goes wrong, right? It malfunctions, you've got a solar flare, um, it dies somehow. So we go in there and we take the place where the satellite was providing coverage and we bring the balloons in. And those balloons have comms equipment that can replace the signals that the satellites were sending. And now you've got connections between points on the ground again. There's a lot of other things you can use this for too. The solar flare thing makes a good opening for a story, but that's obviously a rare occurrence. Um, and we would hope not to see these used in that way. Um, but there's a lot of other, anything you could use an airplane or a satellite for, um, think remote sensing, precision agriculture, monitoring crops, providing comms. We talked about Loon and how they're lighting up cell phones in places where there was no infrastructure before, the disaster relief cases, atmospheric studies. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this. Um, one of the ones that we've looked at recently is infrared, so firefighters, right? If you want to know where this wildfire is, you may not have a satellite parked right there. Um, this is an infrared image that we took from a balloon this year. And so if you can provide that balloon up there station seeking over that fire, you can provide awareness to those firefighters to know where they need to go to, to do the next step in the battle. So there's a lot of cool stuff that comes out of this. Um, I mostly just wanted to talk about that, but if I have to bring some conclusions out of this, because it's supposed to be a, a good packaged up talk, right? So one thing would be, again, if there's any engineers in the crowd, one of the lessons to learn from this and that I've learned from this working on it the last few years is, you know, sometimes the best solution and the simplest solution isn't the obvious solution. So if you're working on something and trying to think of ideas, don't, don't throw things out because they might be crazy. Work it through. Sometimes things that are in front of us don't jump right out at us. And then for those of you who aren't engineers, but maybe fly on airplanes, the next time you're on an airplane, you can just think about balloons and you'll, you'll feel better about your life. Uh, <laughs> and who knows, you know, the next solar cycle peaks in about 2025, so... Maybe in a few years you'll be wanting to call the balloon guy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>